Yeah, Good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online Lecture 145 and Glaucoma Session 49. And today we have a special session with Dr. Santosh Hunavasar, which happens to be his first lecture for all of us. Uh, Oski not included, but this is his first lecture on iFocus Online. And he'll be talking on Mind the Mimic, Recognize the Real, the tumors masquerading as glaucoma. And uh, I request uh, her, sir, to please introduce him. He requires no introduction, but please, sir, all yours. Thank you, Rolika. And uh, we are really, really proud to have Santosh here because I think he's one of the most sincere persons I've met in my life. And uh, he initially uh, was at Api Center and then moved to LV Prasad. And then he set up single-handedly the entire plasty unit in Center for Sight. Uh, primarily in Hyderabad, but obviously he looks after the entire plasty everywhere. And uh, his list of awards and honors and and the number of publications are mind-boggling. Uh, it it will be really difficult. I, I think anybody who is an ophthalmology and doesn't know Santosh is in the wrong place. So we are proud to have uh, Dr. Santosh here and please go ahead, sir. Thank you so much, sir. I'll share my screen. And thank you, sir, for bringing all these lectures for the postgraduates. And thanks for being the mastermind behind this. Thank you, sir. So I'll be talking about tumors and glaucoma. And uh, I think this is a very incongruous kind of a topic because you've been hearing so much about glaucoma all these days. And why this came up is not because of anything else. Just that we couldn't find an international speaker who would agree for this particular slot. I had a lot of people on consideration, but some of them dropped out. So I had a slot and I thought I would use it. Now, uh, if you look at your busy OPD, glaucoma OPD, or even as a postgraduate student, if you uh, are in posted in the glaucoma clinic, you see everything gray. In a glaucoma clinic, everything looks like congenital glaucoma, IC syndrome, primary angle closure glaucoma, primary open angle glaucoma and new vascular glaucoma. In that will be hidden something sinister, and that is what we'll talk about. Now, tumors and glaucoma have many mechanisms, one of which is angle closure, which could be appositional or synecule. Outflow obstruction could be because of deposits of tumor material or secondary changes because of the tumor, such as hyphema or hypopion, or it could be infiltrative directly by the tumor. Neovascular glaucoma in tumors also has several mechanisms which I will come to. There could be elevated intra episcleral venous pressure and most of these have combined mechanisms. It's not just one. Since this is interactive, I have uh, two of my fellows who, would, who I would like to come on camera and answer this. Rolika, if you see a patient like this, refer to you as shallow anterior chamber. What is your first thought on this? So it could obviously, be... there is shallow anterior chamber, but yes. is it uniformly shallow? No, it's irregular. It is irregular. You can see some amount of depth there <laughs> and it is very, very shallow here. And it is unilateral and it is sectoral. It is confined to, say, three clock hours or four clock hours. So if there is irregular shallowing of the anterior chamber, not uniform, not bilateral, not even bilateral asymmetrical, but sectoral in one eye, then you should suspect what? Mm. And it is bumpy. You can see it is bumpy. It is not like uniformly elevated. Yeah, like so a mass see. which is pushing the... Uh, yeah. And a small one at that. A small one at that. If it were to be a larger mass, then you would see a dome. Here you see only a hum. And the only way you can know what is behind is by doing anterior segment imaging. So this is the first point that I'm drawing it across that if you have an angle closure suspect where anterior chamber depth is irregular, not uniformly shallow, and if it is unilateral, and worse, even if it is sectoral, then you should do imaging to see what is behind the iris that is pushing the iris forward. And in this case, it is a lucky cyst. Cyst is lucky because it doesn't really cause any damage. This is a much larger cyst. These are called iris pigment epithelial cysts. There are many variant of iris cysts. This is iris pigment epithelial cyst, which is a peripheral cyst. The, this is a mid-zonal cyst. Actually, it is seen when the pupil is dilated. And as you see here, the anterior chamber is shallow on the 
temporal side exactly where a cyst is located. So imaging is mandatory because in certain situations you might find a solid lesion. Like this is not a cyst, this is a solid lesion and it is also closing the angle to cyst. So that is a tumor. We can sort it out whether it's a melanoma or a melanocytoma, but the first point is to know whether it is a cyst or a solid tumor. Now, there are certain overlays as well, like this patient, young lady, presented with a iris pigment epithelial cyst. Now, we are happy about it. She just has a cyst. Of course, we have to do imaging. And what do we find? We find a cyst associated with a solid lesion. So, they could be a mixture of a cyst and a solid lesion. <coughs> this cyst was secondary. It collapsed after plaque brachytherapy for the ciliary body melanoma. So cyst and solid lesions can coexist. Now this can look like this patient came with a history of trauma and this can look like iridodialysis, but what is behind is what is important. This patient has no NVI, no other sign, pressure is reasonably okay, but there is a solid lesion there which is causing iridodialysis. So this is tumor-induced iridodialysis caused by a ciliary body melanoma. Now, these are the four types of cysts that we talk about. But what is also important, apart from primary cysts, are the secondary cysts which cause elevated intraocular pressure. This is iris stromal cysts. Stromal cysts are generally because of prior trauma or surgery. This is nothing but uh, epithelial cell migration, and that causes stabicular mesh for blockage. Now, how do you differentiate if you're a glaucoma specialist or if you're training in glaucoma, how do you differentiate a benign tumor where you can actually do any intraocular procedure or it's a malignant tumor. You should look at the pupil first. If the pupil is nice, round and central, it is likely to be a benign lesion like this is a nevus and the iris stomal architecture is maintained. So normal central pupil, that is first point. Second is normal iris stomal architecture. Third point is that no NVI. Fourth point is that there is minimal pigment release or no pigment release at all. So when you do gonioscopy, you don't find the trabecular mesh work in a dependent position, abnormally pigmented. As opposed to this, this is also a benign tumor. What do you think this is, Prolika or Christy? This is a larger benign tumor. I have already given you the clue. Was, what you saw was a nevus. This is slightly higher than the nevus. You can call it a nevus plus. This is melanocytoma or magnocellular nevus, where again, there is nice round central pupil. Iris stoma is not altered, but there is dusty deposition of pigment on the surface of the iris and in the dependent position, there is a clump of pigment. So this is depository pigmentation in the trabecular meshwork caused by this, this cohesive darkly pigmented melanocytic tumor, which is melanocytoma. You can see how discohesive it is. It is, it is pregnant with a lot of pigment, which it keeps releasing and depositing it in the anterior chamber. And that is how these patients tend to have glaucoma. Note that pupil is nice, round and central. Stromal architecture is maintained. There is no NBI. Yet the patient has glaucoma and that is melanocytoma. So how do you differentiate in a situation where there is a clinical dilemma? You can always do a iris biopsy. You can do a fine needle as patient cytology and figure it out. All done by a clear corneal approach without breaching the conjunctiva, which is very important. When you're doing a biopsy, it has to be clear corneal approach. Otherwise, tumor can seed in the conjunctiva and be prone to metastasis. Again, iris melanocytoma. As opposed to melanocytoma, when we come to the melanoma spectrum, there is this irregularity of the lesion itself and the pupil, and there is neovascularization of the iris. And the amount of pigment that is generated is much more than a benign lesion. You can see a small lesion like this generating so much of pigment in the trabecular meshwork in the dependent area. And that's a feathery melanoma. That's a more localized, a nodular melanoma. But I don't know whether you can see on the screen or not. There is florid blood vessel within the lesion. That's called intrinsic vascularity. Iris stoma is played. That is the second point. Pupil is distorted and there is neovascularization of the iris. So this is a small melanoma where all you need to do is sexual iridectomy. And this patient presented with intractable glaucoma not responding to medical therapy. You can see the angle closed by synical closure because of a tumor which is pulling the iris towards the trabecular meshwork. So this was a melanoma with desmoplastic activity causing secondary glaucoma. 
Now, this looks like a broad ciliary body band. Actually, it is not. It is called the ring melanoma of the trabecular meshwork, which is a notorious form of glaucoma because you don't even guess that it is ring melanoma unless you do a good UPM or anterior segment OCT apart from gonioscopy. Then only you'll see the lesion. This is a curious case where the earlier diagnosis was iridocornal endothelial syndrome because of which this patient has undergone a trabeculectomy. That is a trabecular meshwork ostium that has been created and that's a curiously round PI. But behind the PI, what are you supposed to see, Christy? If behind the PI you see dark, what are the possibilities? Um, ciliary body. All right. So if you see something dark behind the pupil, that could there could be a mass, or it could be an incomplete or a lamellar PI. This is not a lamellar PI. Behind the PI, you see something dark, and even in the pupillary area, you see something dark. There is corectopia and ectopia on UVA and new vascularization of the iris. So you suspect that this is not a case of IC syndrome, but actually a diffuse iris melanoma. So this patient undergoes enucleation. Now, when somebody has already undergone, say, a trabeculectomy and the blep is there, you perform what is called a end block excision. That means you go around the bleb and then do complete the rest of the peritomy and then complete the enucleation, taking the bleb along with the specimen that is enucleated. That's called end block excision. So you have to respect the integrity of the bleb. Why is that so? Because the bleb is already seeded by, with the tumor and you don't want to leave any portion of the bleb of conjunctiva behind in the socket. And as is evident, you can see this is the scleral flap. Under the scleral flap, there is tumor. And this is the blep, which again is infiltrated with the tumor. And that is the melanoma that we are talking about, diffuse iris melanoma with a nodular posterior component and the trabecular meshwork filled with melanoma. So that is how you do enucleation in a patient who has undergone trabeculectomy. Now, what about ocular surface tumors? Do they cause glaucoma at all? Well, this was an African individual who had undergone multiple conjunctival surgeries. There was no histopathology at all. He had new vascularization of the iris. Ectopion UVA is obvious. And he had a ciliary body mass. So how did this patient who has no prior history of malignancy just has undergone multiple conjunctival surgery, thinking that it was the current pterygium elsewhere in Africa, had this ciliary body lesion? What are the possibilities? Now, this is the fundus photograph showing a large ciliary body lesion, mm -hmm. which is partially melanotic. That is the ultrasound large mass involving the nasal ciliary body. So what are you thinking about here? Any guesses, Rolika? Mm -hmm. Prior conjunctival surgery, intractable glaucoma, neovascularization of the iris, a ciliary body mass. Is it possible that there was a ciliary yeah. body mass that was extraocular or and is it a that the conjunctival lesion was a malignant lesion and that went intraocular? Yeah. Possible. Both are possible. That was the ultrasound biomicroscopy showing the ciliary body mass. Since the patient had neovascular glaucoma, we had to do enucleation of this patient and this was an aggressive squamous cell carcinoma. And how did it get into the eye? This beautiful picture shows it all. Yeah. This is a crack in the sclera through which this conjunctival lesion had gone intraocular. So this is a nice track that you see, and that is possible. So whenever you excise a conjunctival lesion, you have to do histopath. That is, apart from that, if a patient has a, a conjunctival malignancy, it is possible that it may become intraocular and cause glaucoma. Now, this patient has, after a session of a conjunctival malignancy, developed a hypopion corneal ulcer. That's what we thought of. Corneal ulcer healed, but the hypopion did not heal and there was some blood streaking. And after corneal ulcer healed, when UBM was done, there was a huge ciliary body mass that had obviously an intraocular extension of a pre-existing conjunctival lesion. This patient had neovascular glaucoma. You can see florid neovascularization of the area. In a patient with glaucoma. So every patient who has some amount of scleral invasion, we have to do anterior segment uh, imaging so that we rule out ciliary body extension, trabecular meshwork extension, all of this can cause secondary glaucoma. So what are the cases that simulate granulomatous uveitis and glaucoma? Tapioca melanoma is a variant of melanoma that can simulate granulomatous uveitis and secondary glaucoma. You can see this 
discrete nodules, which is very typical of papillary melanoma. You can actually think that it is Cogandry syndrome. If you're not used to looking at Cogandry syndrome, you first time when you look at it, you might think these nodules represent Cogandry syndrome, but it is not. This is a special variant of melanoma called tapioca melanoma. Metastasis can also cause granulomatous kind of uveitis with secondary glaucoma with new vascularization of the iris. Metastasis can cause iris nodules as well as hypopion. This was an adenocarcinoma of the large intestine metastasizing to the iris. No hypopion in glaucoma. This was a 60-year-old maid with hypopion with high intraocular pressure. Hypopion can clog the trabecular mesh work and cause elevated intraocular pressure. So whenever there is white eye uveitis, this is a white eye. There is no circumcellary congestion, which is remarkable. And a hypopion, you should think of a leukemia or a lymphoma. This is a patient again, where there is high intraocular pressure and a larger hypopion. And the same patient after resolution of hypopion has plastering of large cells on the endothelium. So this is again a patient with lymphoma. So white eye hypopion with elevated intraocular pressure, you should suspect lymphoma and leukemia. It could be ALL, AML or even CML. Now in a child with high pressure with white eye hypopion, you should suspect either medulloepithelioma or retinoblastoma. Now all these are patients with medulloepithelioma and retinoblastoma. You can see that there is a mass here in the ciliary body resulting in hypopion and new vascularization of the iris that is a medullary epithelioma. Now this is a retinoblastoma with anterior segment infiltration, D-shaped pupil in a retinoblastoma or flattening of the pupillary contour. Pupillaries should be like this, but if the pupil contour becomes flattened at one angle, that is how you suspect a ciliary body extension in retinoblastoma. These children may actually present like congenital glaucoma. In fact, Unless these patients had this anterior segment invasion, you would suspect that they have congenital or developmental glaucoma if they had cataract also. For this, for example, this patient were to have cataract and no anterior ch chamber deposits at all, there's no way you can differentiate it from developmental glaucoma with cataract. So because cornea becomes enlarged in these patients very early on in the phase of glaucoma, and they have a hidden tumor behind, and many of these patients undergo trabeculectomy, especially those with medullo epithelium of the ciliary body, 50% of the patients are most diagnosed as cataract and glaucoma before they are picked up. Many of these patients undergo trabeculectomy multiple times and even a tube shunt because they have not been imaged. So it is mandatory to evaluate a child with unilateral secondary, unilateral congenital or developmental glaucoma with appropriate imaging tools. In fact, ultrasound biomicroscopy under anesthesia is mandatory before you go in for a glaucoma surgical procedure. So medullary epithelioma of the ciliary body presents with balls of hypopion cells, which are in the form of balls, which are like sago granules, larger translucent cells, as you see here, which can be of various shape and size. And when you do gonioscopy, you you'll find that the angle is already infiltrated and behind that you would find a ciliary body mass. So both these patients have medullary epithelioma of the ciliary body. It can cause glaucoma. It is notorious to cause glaucoma. And many of these patients are missed. They're misdiagnosed as developmental glaucoma or cataract. This is again a patient with medullopithelioma of the ciliary body presenting with, you can see larger corneal diameter and in fact, an intercalary cephaloma. And on dilated fundus examination, you find the large ciliary body band that is medullopithelioma. And this was a curious case. This was an elderly lady who had undergone cataract by a very good cataract surgeon who is a comprehensive ophthalmologist himself. He swears that he had dilated her and looked at her eye very carefully. Six months later, she presented with very high intraocular pressure which is not responding to medicine, medical management. And behind the pupil was a yellowish lesion. You can see florid neovascularization of the iris. Intraocular pressure was 48 millimeter of mercury. Now, how did this happen in six months? We thought it was a metastasis. It, it could have been a amelanotic melanoma. PET scan was done. It was taking up only in the eye. There was no systemic uh, lesion. It looked like a cholestered appearance. So we thought it was a metas uh, it was a amelanotic melanoma and the patient underwent enucleation. So in the specimen is very beautiful. You can see that this was a teratoid benign medullary epithelioma, this bluish staining lesion. From that has arisen 
a teratoid malignant medulloepithelioma all of a sudden in a 68-year-old lady who never earlier was diagnosed to have a medulloepithelioma. So medulloepithelioma can remain quiet for several years, decades, in fact, and suddenly can turn malignant. This is the benign component and that's the malignant component. So even in an adult presenting with a ciliary body mass, which is amelanotic, with high pressures and neovascular glaucoma, you can put medulloepithelioma, a rare variant, as a differential diagnosis. So one more lesion, which is not a tumor that can cause glaucoma because of anterior chamber deposits with cholesterol or refractal granules or anterior chamber cholesterolosis is Coates disease. It can cause depository blockage of the trabecula meshwood. So all these can cause glaucoma, metastasis, lymphoma, leukemia, retinoblastoma, medulloepithelioma can all cause hypopion and glaucoma. So coming to hyphema, this was a 14-year-old child with pain, redness, and watering, with blurred vision of one month, diagnosed as hyphema with secondary glaucoma. She had shuttlecock injury at school. That is a history. Uh, well, this hyphema was not responding to oral pranexamic acid, oral steroids, topical steroids, all has been given. Now, this hyphema is recurring. You can see clot blood here and fresh blood left. So that, that was the situation always that she would have one the earlier hyphema clotting and reducing and then she would re-bleed and for re-bleed generally tranexamic acid and steroids are given and it was not responding this was a 14 year old girl we did a ubm and you can find that the iris is definitely thickened so iris thickening has no business to be there in traumatic hyphema this patient underwent peripheral blood smear thinking that there could be some infiltrative disorder it was negative bone marrow biopsy was negative so why do you think christy this patient, where we were suspecting that she could have leukemia, had normal peripheral blood smear and normal bone marrow. I gave a history already. She was on two drugs, tranexamic acid and, mm -hmm. and oral steroids. Mm -hmm. So would oral steroid be the culprit? Right? Yeah. Yeah. If you give oral steroids to a patient who has leukemia, then the peripheral blood smear will be rid of abnormal circulating leukocytes with a, even a short course of steroids. So peripheral blood smear can be negative in these patients. Even bone marrow biopsy can be negative with three weeks course of steroids that she had already had. Iris biopsy could diagnose her as a case of AML. Iris biopsy is the la iris is the last to be affected. It still had infiltrative lesion. So there we diagnosed as AML and patient received systemic chemotherapy and for the eye, obviously we have to give radiation. That was the area where biopsy had been performed and her iris thickening actually completely normalized following radiation. So hyphema is one of the manifestations of leukemia in a child who does not see basically what is happening in all these patients is that there is one atypical point, which is like the sentinel sign because of which we are able to pick up a tumor like hyphema should never have iris thickening. And that was a lead point here. Now, this is a patient where there was nearly full chamber hyphema. And she again gave a history of trauma. When the hyphema started resolving, we could see a black necrotic lesion in the iris periphery. Hyphema finally resolved. We did plaque brachytherapy. This is a ciliary body melanoma with iris extension, which could be treated. Fortunately, it was within the realm of plaque brachytherapy. Why did it bleed? Because the tumor was Necrotic. Necrotic tumor often bleeds. Now, this is a patient where the pressure is very high. She has uh, intraocular pressure of 38 despite three topical medications and she was on Dimox as well. And she has what looks like a conjunctival lesion. But if you look at it carefully, there is a lesion, black lesion in the angle. This is again a ring melanoma of the iris and trabecular meshwork. And that can mask out as glaucoma. Now, this patient appears to have a multifocal conjunctival pigmentation. But when you look at the eye, you can find the reason. Reason is an iris melanoma with conjunctival seeding. So when you look at what is striking, sometimes you may miss what is lying behind and what is the cause of this. This is also a patient where there is elevated intraocular pressure. What looks like a pigmented lesion, that is just the iris pigment epithelium, which is displaced by or splayed by the lesion. There is a iridodialysis caused by the lesion, which is very vascular and yellow, and it is causing transillumination. 
that's a iris ciliary body lyomyoma causing secondary glaucoma so in children there could be situations where there is streak hyphema and elevated intraocular pressure intermittently causing this damage <clears throat> in in between episodes of bleeding if you look at these patients you will find a yellowish placoid lesion that is juvenile xanthogranuloma again a cause for hyphema when you look at these children uh, the skin do you find this macules which are the cutaneous manifestations of juvenile xanthogranuloma okay. coming on to more serious cases this was a child i had seen 20 years ago 6 year old child redness in the left eye for one week following trauma with a tree branch and all the telltale signs of trauma she has she has even a lid laceration to justify her complaint that she indeed had trauma and she has full chamber hyphema no she had high intraocular pressure so this glaucoma specialist did a ultrasound uh, already and he and it was reported that the child had low to medium internal reflectivity but what is missed is this area of calcification through which the cross vector is not passing suppose the cross vector were to pass through this area then we would have definitely found yeah. high internal reflectivity so this calcium was missed the child underwent hyphema drainage the child had corneal staining after 7 months the child presented with preauricular swelling and a extraocular mass that was orbital extension of retinoblastoma with regional lymph node metastasis and also optic nerve extension and intracranial extension to which the child succumbed so never do any intraocular surgery in a patient with hyphema until you do either a good b scan or a ct scan or any imaging which is appropriate so enlarged cornea in all situations need not be developmental glaucoma even if it's unilateral or bilateral this kind is bilateral enlarged cornea if the cornea were to be more hazy then you would miss this yellowish or whitish reflect and if you miss doing a good imaging then you would treat this patient with trabeculotomy and trabeculectomy so many of the patients who have congenital glaucoma what looks like congenital glaucoma have had a tumor inside and they have undergone trabeculectomy we see that quite often this patient was actually referred to a glaucoma specialist by a ophthalmologist in the periphery uh, for uh, management of glaucoma and on pupillary dilatation you find that there is yellowish reflex behind the detached retina and that is a retinoblastoma with orbital extension already so congenital glaucoma can be one of the what looks like congenital glaucoma can actually be retinoblastoma retinoblastoma can also cause glaucoma because of inflammation and also shallowing of the anterior chamber by a bullous retinal detachment pushing the iris lens diaphragm anteriorly now why some of the patients with uh, tumors develop neovascular glaucoma there are three mechanisms one is the tumor vascularity itself that causes kind of you know it passes over to the iris second is vegf is released by many of the aggressive tumors that is one of the mechanisms because of which there is neovascularization of the iris the third mechanism is central retinal vein occlusion because of infiltration now this patient has a large melanoma of the uh, choroid that can cause lot of uh, vegf release and that can cause neovascularization of the iris this is a patient again with melanoma with neovascularization of the iris and the tumor was removed from the iris there it is nowhere near the iris the, the only mechanism for neovascular glaucoma in this patient could be vegf whereas this patient had a melanocytoma of the optic nerve head suddenly it turned different it necrosed and the patient had seen central retinal artery and venous occlusion and later on developed neovascular glaucoma mainly because of crvo and you can see that the melanocytoma is extended axially thus occluding the central retinal vein and causing neovascularization so there are some sentinels glaucomas in phacomatosis how much time do i have you have time sir please okay. go on these are the phacomatosis uh, in which glaucoma can be seen so if you have a patient with phacomatosis if it goes to a glaucoma specialist they should look for a tumor and if the such a phacomatosis goes to a retina specialist or a ocular oncologist then they should definitely monitor for glaucoma so it cuts both ways we can't absolve our responsibility just because we see a tumors we can't say that uh, we didn't di diagnose glaucoma and vice versa sturge weber syndrome neurofibromatosis 
Wonderful Indo disease, Nemosophota, and phacomatosis pigmentovascularis are the five phacomatosis that can have glaucoma. Now identify this person and what does he have? Just to wake you up, Prolica and Christy. Neurofibromatosis. Very famous personality, Nobel Prize laureate. P Nobel Prize was peace. Anybody knows? Perestroika, Gorbachev. M Mikhail Gorbachev. Mikhail Gorbachev, correct. And he had Sturge Weber syndrome. And you can see nervous flamias here, right? So, nervous flamias like this can have tumor, which is, which is, hemangioma. Right. So, they have diffuse choroidal hemangioma and they also have. Glaucoma. Of course, for diffuse choroidal hemangioma, you do brachytherapy. And if a patient, recently we had a patient where there was trabeculectomy done already for a patient with uh, uh, this uh, Sturgeweber syndrome. And uh, basically, we have to save the trabeculectomy. You have to make our conjunctival peritomy in a different area to put in a plaque for diffuse choroidal hemangioma. Now, what do you think is this? This is a very nice picture. What do you, what do you think is this? Neurofibromatosis. Right. So this is not dish nodule. This is iris mammalation. So if you find thickening of the iris with fishnet-like appearance or discrete mammalations, that is one of the ocular or iris manifestations of neurofibromatosis type 1. Of course, dish nodules are very famous and they're very easily diagnosed. They can be of various color. You can see that it is creamy here. It is slightly darker brown here. So these nodules, if you find on the iris, Irrespective of anything else, you can diagnose these patients to have neurofibromatosis. So, of the diagnostic criteria. Now, NF1 can present with glaucoma because of many reasons. It can present with glaucoma because of uh, uh, this uh, uh, developmental abnormality of the anterior chamber angle, infiltrative lesion in the anterior chamber angle, increase in episcleral venous pressure. There are a lot of mechanisms of developmental glaucoma in a child with neurofibromatosis type 1. This child has congenital glaucoma or developmental glaucoma has already undergone trabeculectomy. He was referred for proptosis, which was resultant of a meningoencephalocele. Now, again, there is an overlay in phacomatosis. You can see that this child has subtle nervous flemmies. Now, this is a child with optic nerve glioma with congenital glaucoma or developmental glaucoma. So, neurofibromatosis can cause glaucoma. And if a child has neurofibromatosis, then the glaucoma specialist should definitely image these children with a CT scan or MRI to look for optic nerve glioma because sometimes a prominent eye can mask a tumor that is lying behind the eye. So we all assume that, okay, this eye has, is prominent because of glaucoma, the cornea is enlarged, maybe it's bufthalmic and we may not even image these patients, thus missing that optic nerve glioma that these children have. So that is something that we must remember. VHL can also have a glaucoma overlay. VHL can cause glaucoma by elevated intraocular, elevated episcleral venous pressure. It can also have trabecular dysgenesis. VHL can also present with a dysangioma, as you see here. And whenever a glaucoma specialist gets a case of VHL, like everybody else does, they should also make sure that systemic evaluation is performed. Now, the next thing that goes to glaucoma specialist mainly rather than to a retina specialist or ocular oncologist is, what is this? Nevus of water. Nevus of water or oculocutaneous melanocytosis. It can have many variations. It could just be periocular melanocytosis. It could be episcleral melanocytosis, which can be very subtle. It may not even be seen in the anterior sclera. It may be seen in the posterior sclera. But irrespective of all that, if a patient has melanocytosis like this, you have to make the child open the mouth and look at the palate for palatal melanocytosis because those children have a tendency to have esophageal melanocytosis and esophageal melanoma and also lift their hair up and look at the hairline for pigmentation, which is a sentinel sign for meningeal melanoma, meningeal melanocytosis. So if a child has hairline pigmentation, then MRI with contrast has to be performed. When you look at their fundus, what is striking is the difference in color. The eye with melanocytosis has a darker choroidal pigmentation. Well, that is all they will have initially. But as they progress, they may develop lesions like this. You can see darkening of the disc here and subtle elevation of the choroid. 
and when you do imaging at that stage you might find that a lesion is developing so melanocytosis can develop into evolve into choroidal melanoma and when it does it is often multifocal choroidal melanoma not in one area of the choroid but many areas of the choroid and you see that the, this particular patient did not have much pigmentation in the anterior sclera when we enucleate you find such dark pigmentation in the posterior sclera so it's sometimes difficult to make out that the patient has episcleral melanocytosis and promptly there is a diffuse choroidal melanoma and patients who have large patches like this are features of what is this disorder pigmentovascularis so they have pigmentation as they, they, it's a kind of mixture of all they have sturge weber like features they have uh, you know vhl type features they have um, almost everything mixture of all phacomatoses even nf type features that's pigmentovascularis so basically in a patient who has coexisting uh, tumor and glaucoma complexities are that no penetrating surgery should be performed because if you do that then an intraocular tumor will become extraocular if it is a malignant tumor and to control intraocular pressure you have to resort to medical management of glaucoma or at most laser procedures no tube no penetrating intraocular surgery if a patient has already undergone a inadvertent trabeculectomy and it makes the tumor extraocular and increases the risk of metastasis and if at all we plan a uh, say brachytherapy in a patient who has choroidal hemangioma then blood preservation is the approach we have to preserve the blood so some of the last thoughts are that uh, if you are a glaucoma specialist or a postgraduate training in glaucoma or a fellow training in glaucoma you should be alert to atypical features in a patient with glaucoma it's very important to note that a, if a patient has some, something which is not routinely seen in a given set of cases anterior segment imaging for iris and ciliary body lesions and all unilateral glaucoma with unknown cause is mandatory all children with glaucoma i would suggest a b scan should be done unless the fundus is very clearly visible all hyphema and uveitis where fundus view is unclear a b scan has to be done all unilateral neovascularization of the iris new nvg of unknown etiology you must do imaging so imaging is the key to diagnose what is hidden behind the iris and you may find interestingly some sometimes sometimes a tumor in, in you know behind and behind the iris or in the ciliary part thank you so much thank you very much santosh i think that was really really wonderful it and i think i and prateep have also learned a lot <laughs> because uh, it, it was no no it is truly you know because we don't really come across so many things and uh, but i think i do distinctly remember uh, and uh, not one not two but in many cases who have been operated for trabeculectomy as congenital glaucoma and they were unilateral retinoblastoma so this is absolutely a disaster and uh, uh, what can one say i think you really hit the key that imaging is the key you cannot there is no way you can uh, neglect that kind of thing i think somewhere near the pg students they should not be allowed to pass unless some key features they know and this is one of that features and uh, very atypical also i think the tumor presentations are so atypical i do remember uh, one of our i won't name but uh, our boss in retina, uh, in rp center who was the head and there was this child who came with uh, i said sir things don't look okay to me no 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 this is uveitis i said sir let us at least do a do a needle this thing and biopsy or something at least and it was a tumor which was not being shown on b scan because it was all along the margins of the uh, globe so it was you can have crazy presentations absolutely so the level of alertness has to be extremely extremely high. and uh, thank you so much uh, for bringing this out uh, prateep please go ahead thank you santosh it was really a great learning <laughs> no uh, just to add what harsh has said you know uh, basically these are so 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 rare conditions that you rarely come across these conditions and uh, if you have this kind of a patient 
then probably your thought process never goes so long that uh, you can think of all these conditions. And suppose if you pick up these conditions, then uh, uh, it is very difficult to find the right person where to send these patients for a proper treatment and proper diagnosis. And if you find the proper person to treat the patient appropriately, then the, most of the time the patient is not willing or they are lost for the follow-up. So the situation is, is very difficult and uh, very rare conditions. Uh, seldomly we are able to diagnose these patients. You know, if you talk of the phacomatosis or nevus of OTA or those kind of stuff, yes, we can pick up these conditions uh, very comfortably. We, uh, we teach uh, to our PGs and fellows all these conditions and they are also competent. But other kinds of tumors are very, very difficult. And sometimes the presentation is so crazy. The patient comes to you with a neovascular glaucoma and you can never think that, you know, this patient can have these kinds of tumors and uh, uh, you are not able to diagnose. And the patient is in such a pain and agony uh, because of very high pressure. Then uh, you suddenly find that, okay, uh, uh, you send the patient to Dr. Santosh. Uh, probably he may be able to diagnose that, you know, this patient, uh, at least on the ultrasound, you are picking, uh, picking up something abnormality. But I don't think that the patient would reach to him. So it's very difficult. And Santosh, really, you are doing a great job that you are teaching us. And uh, you, are, you are training so many PGs and fellows now. And once they will, they will go to different places, then it will be very easy for us to send this patient. And the, for the patient also, it will be very, very beneficial that they will get appropriate uh, treatment and proper diagnosis. So that is a big problem because uh, two, three of the patients being treated by Santosh at Hyderabad. And I tried to coax them, hey, please show to Dr. Vikas. He's been trained by that fellow only, but they will say, no, we will fly to <laughs> Hyderabad only. <laughs> so Santosh, <laughs> if a trabeculectomy has been done mistakenly, what will be the approach now? Depends if it's a malignant tumor, melanoma, then we have no other option but to... For, uh, for retinoblastoma. For retinoblastoma, then it is considered as extraocular retinoblastoma and the child would have to be put on orbital retinoblastoma protocol, so, which means that enucleation is part of it apart from chemotherapy and also radiation. Otherwise, there is a very high chance of uh, orbital retinoblastoma. In fact, in one of the series of orbital retinoblastoma from uh, South America, Many patients who had intraocular surgery, such as cataract surgery or trabeculectomy for unknown retinoblastoma or vitrectomy, had orbital retinoblastoma and a high rate of metastasis as well. So uh, it's mandatory that they have to undergo inflation and multimodal treatment. So forgive my ignorance, I'm completely, uh, I'm not <laughs> really, but do we do a PET scan in these cases? PET scan in children in retinoblastoma, we do, I mean, we always target the area where there is likely metastasis. In retinoblastoma, it is bone marrow and CSF. So we do a bone marrow biopsy and cerebrospinal fluid cytology. That is the primary investigation. And only if bone marrow is positive, then PET scan is done. In children, it is difficult to do PET scan. Whereas in melanoma, PET scan is the primary screening modality because it goes to the liver. So depending on the target area of metastasis, we investigate. So, Santosh, there are many patients, you know, who, who have a reasonably good vision, but uh, they have a, uh, something like, you know, melanocytoma or some ciliary body tumor. So, how do you convince these patients that, you know, they have such a difficult situation and uh, probably some of these patients may require enucleation for their treatment? And uh, how you convince to go for the enucleation, if at all it is required? Many of them don't need enucleation, Pradeep. Actually, um, up to 8 millimeters, we can definitely treat with plaque brachytherapy if it's a melanoma. Retinoblastoma size is not a criteria. In fact, group E tumors also we can treat with intraarterial chemotherapy with very high success. So management of retinoblastoma it has become really very good with a lot of chemotherapy uh, you know, uh, advances. Whereas in melanoma, all we have is plaque brachytherapy and up to 8 millimeter, we can treat them with plaque brachytherapy. Beyond which, you have to tell the patient very honestly that uh, enucleation is the only option for this condition. Otherwise, the patient will have a high rate of systemic metastasis. So 
they will have to trade off between uh, life salvage and eye salvage and they generally would uh, want to lose the eye and try to save life is there something available abroad which is not there at in india or are we completely good we are absolutely fine as far as melanoma all the tumors in fact we have everything you we even have proton beam now in india which is in chennai but remotely operated from hyderabad right. by our oncologists so we have everything mm-hmm. only target therapy is very expensive although the drugs are available well for metastasis of melanoma they are being still tried on a protocol based manner it's very very expensive so that is the reason why it is not being used but the effect is not proven yet they are still under trial so santosh basically it's a it's a team work and a multidisciplinary approach is required so it is not that the competent person like you is sitting and uh, would be able to manage basically you require the entire right. team and the complete infrastructure then only probably you can do the justice right. so if you are training so many uh, right students and uh, they would be going at different places then probably you know uh, they have to first uh, make a good team so that they can deliver the best uh, out of them otherwise it's it's a very difficult thing you know uh, you know, they find a team. They do find a team, and uh, in fact, they act as a nucleus around which a team can easily. All these technologies are easily available in systemic oncology, like intra-arterial chemotherapy. You know, there are interventional neuroradiologists everywhere. All they need is about two days of uh, observation or training to get into the ophthalmic artery. They would have gotten into other arteries. Simply, they have to get into ophthalmic artery. So it's a question of orienting them and finding like-minded young individuals. and that becomes a team is it a, a, a viable option uh, commercially yes it is okay how okay. these pratip how these modalities are important in your practice uh, the ubm and all uh, and who is doing it regularly you do yourself or uh, the retina guy or the glaucoma guy does it no uh, actually uh, initially i used like rp center we are trained to do everything you know sir b scan in fact uh, doctor when i was with doctor atul you know for almost 6 months we had to do all the b scans ourselves all the ubm ourselves so uh, but uh, here there are optometrists who are trained so they come and do it and they are trained so well that uh, they are able to pick up everything and they have time they have uh, the training so they can invest say half an hour 45 minutes and find the entire dimension of the tumor the clock hour of extent everything they give us the information so i we don't really don't have to go and sit with them and do it so that is a big advantage okay so like you know we say that uh, if the technician is doing the echocardiography then uh, probably the cardiologist should be there around uh, you know who can pick up everything because the technician cannot pick up everything so yeah. it's so not the same thing with you absolutely so when we have a, a difference in the sense that what i see clinically does not correlate with uh, what we see on ultrasound uh, you know one of the fellows immediately go down along with the technician optometrist you know try to figure out why is that happening when i am measuring the base differently when the ultrasound base is coming different we actually try to correlate and get the correct data so the last question from my side that what is your final message that when we should refer the patient to a ocular oncologist you know uh, when there is a slightest of iota of doubt uh, some nvis are there the pressure is high and we are not able to pick up and is is that the point when we should uh, take your help when you find a mass on imaging definitely if you don't find a mass on imaging but if you have a suspicion that you know it is very very atypical and you are not able to figure out the reason why this patient has intractable elevation of intraocular pressure <clears throat> then possibly if a patient for example has signs of ic syndrome and has neovascularization of the iris it could be as well a diffuse iris melanoma which very very clearly masquerades as ic syndrome so in that situation you would need an iris biopsy from a clear corneal approach so if you can do an iris biopsy from a clear corneal approach and you have a good trained uh, 
ophthalmic oncopathologist, then that is great. Otherwise, you can always send these patients out for a biopsy. Or if a patient has a pigmented uh, lesion where you want to do trabeculectomy and you're not sure whether it's melanocytoma or melanoma, then again, you can send for a biopsy. So, for example, melanocytoma can be managed, glaucoma and melanocytoma can be managed with tube shunts and trabeculectomy. Whereas in, if in case it's melanoma, then you cannot do that. There's a huge difference in the way we manage. When we should refer a case of nevosophota to you? Nevosophota, uh, well, if a patient is being seen by a retina specialist regularly, then there is no need to send until there is a change in the appearance. Change in appearance means thickening of the choroid, subrectal fluid, florid uh, orange pigment or lipofusion, which was earlier not there, or the change, the diameter of the patch changes or the thickness changes. That is the point of referral because that is the point where it is turning into a melanoma. So otherwise, as long as they remain stable, you don't have to. But one important thing in nevus of water, which I forgot to mention is that well, we always can easily look at the choroid. Choroid is very easy to look at, I mean retina basically, but you cannot ever look at the ciliary body. Patients are never cooperative for indentation. You can at the most see ora serrata. So once a year, at least they should undergo 360 degree UBM. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah, because most of the patients of uh, nevus of ota that are coming to us for melanoma have a ciliary body or a ciliochoroidal melanoma which is impossible to make out on routine clinical evaluation, even with full dilatation and on fundus evaluation. So they have to undergo anterior segment imaging. I think UBM is a very good tool. 360 degree UBM is required at least once a year. How to do the follow-up for the optic nerve head melanocytoma? Because you know you have shown one patient who has developed CRVU. So if you have told the patient that you have this problem, and uh, one fine day, if he comes to you with a CRVO, so he would uh, obviously blame you that, you know, you have not treated me well. So, melanocytoma, there is no treatment, actually. It is observation only, unless the patient has secondary features, such as melanocytoma can develop a CNVM, then you can treat it. Melanocytoma can become necrotic, then you can give them, you know, a short duration steroids. But melanocytoma, unfortunately, optic disc melanocytoma, because of the location, there is absolutely no treatment that is possible. It's only observation. And very rarely they do develop a vascular occlusion because it actually progresses along the optic nerve. Otherwise, it's a superficially spreading lesion. Thank you. There's a question, sir, that um, uh, this is by Dr. Ankita. She's asking that in a child with leukemia, with recurrent hemorrhage, uh, UBM showed uniform iris thickening. Now, in such a case, uh, how do you decide uh, what site of uh, iris biopsy will there be? Like the site of focal iris thickening despite of having the area of uh, hyphema? Whichever is logistically convenient. If it's uniformly eye thickening, uniform iris thickening. If it's localized thickening, you have to go to the you have to go to the area where there is iris thickening and then do it. But before iris biopsy, always do peripheral blood smear and bone marrow biopsy if both are inconfirmatory, then only you should do iris biopsy, not otherwise. There is no need to do iris biopsy if the peripheral blood smear and bone marrow biopsy are able to figure out uh, leukemia. Our case, I did only because the child was on steroid for three weeks already and both peripheral blood smear and bone marrow, which I showed, were negative in this child. And we had to get a diagnosis, so we did an iris biopsy. And so what if there is a localized thickening in the area of hyphema? Well, localized thickening in the area of hyphema is obviously then you have to drain hyphema through a clear corneal approach, visualize the iris and do a biopsy. I'm stressing on clear corneal approach because otherwise if you violate the conjunctiva, then there is infiltration. As long as you stay clear corneal, a couple of millimeter away from the limbus, then cornea being avascular, there is no chance of extraocular extension or metastasis. How important is the simple gonioscopy in your practice? In the surface neoplasia, uh, sometime you know it, it penetrates and it goes into the uh, angle. Uh, do you ask for the gonioscopy or you yeah. just rely on the UBM? No, no, we always do gonioscopy for any ocular surface neoplasia where a sclera is involved, 
gonioscopy is the first approach any any patient who has a iris pigmented lesion we do gonioscopy gonioscopy is done by ourselves we don't ask a glaucoma specialist to do a gonioscopy so all these are clinical evaluation tools that we have to be conversant with so unless we see we cannot believe anybody say, you know saying that okay there is pigmentation but what what significance would you attribute to that pigmentation is something that we have to figure out ourselves okay so we are looking forward for some gonioscopy picture from your side in the next <laughs> <laughs> Actually, sir, uh, Harsh sir and Pradeep sir both mentioned that these cases are like so rare and so rare to find. I think Christy and I would actually thank you for making this unusual, very usual for us because you, because of you, we land up seeing these cases so often. Really, thanks a lot for that, sir. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Santosh, for taking this class more for us than for anybody else. I think <laughs> we're really happy. Thank you, Santosh. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good night. Good night.